This morning, our scripture reading will be one of the most hopeful and significant passages in all of scripture, 1 Corinthians chapters 15, verses 1 through 20. Now I make known to you, brethren, the gospel which I preach to you, which also you received, in which also you stand, by which also you are saved, if you hold fast the word which I preach to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 brethren at one time, most of whom remain until now, but some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared to me also. For I am the least of the apostles, and not fit to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God I am what I am, and his grace toward me did not prove vain, but I labored even more than all of them, Yet not I, but the grace of God with me. Whether then it was I or they, so we preach, and so you believed. Now if Christ is preached that he has been raised from the dead, how do some among you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain, your faith also is in vain. Moreover, we are even found to be false witnesses of God because we testified against God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise, if in fact the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is worthless, you are still in your sins." Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If we have hoped in Christ in this life only, we are of all men most to be pitied. But now Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who are asleep. I need to pray. Father, thank you for sending Jesus. Thank you for his perfect life, his substitutionary death, and his resurrection. Lord, thank you for the privilege of being able to communicate a great message of hope like that. I pray today that you speak through me in a clear and understandable way that we would all benefit, eternally benefit from the truth of your word. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. So Adam had one job, (laughs) just one. Don't eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. With that one job came eternal consequence. There was a warning. If you eat of that tree, then you will surely die. Now, what did God mean by death? Well, first of all, there was the immediate Spiritual death. And we know that happened because Adam and Eve, after eating of the fruit, they instantly recognized that they were naked and they hid themselves. And then when they heard the sound of God in the garden, they tried to hide themselves from God. There was a, there was a change inside their innocence died. And there was the birth of something different. It was the birth of death. But there was also 
a second sense in which they would die, and that is physical death. Now, of course, the physical death was not immediate, but the process began by which ultimately Adam and Eve would physically die. Death wasn't part of the creation of God until sin entered the world. And Paul says in Romans chapter 5 that death reigned. We're here today and the reality is that if Jesus doesn't come back, every one of us will die. Nobody's defeated it yet. Save one, Jesus. But death reigns. Paul said, just as through one man, Adam, sin entered the world and death through sin, so death spread to all men because all sin. Now, history records the inevitability of the curse of sin, which is death. Cemeteries are full of testimonials of the fact that sin causes death. And Adam's curse has visited all of his progeny. Imagine then the reaction of Martha, who was mourning over the fact that this friend of theirs, Jesus, walked the earth, and they had seen him do amazing things. They had seen people healed with just the speaking of a word from Jesus. You see, Lazarus had been sick, and they sent a messenger to go find Jesus and let him know that they were sick. But Jesus tarried, and he didn't immediately go to the household where Lazarus lay. Then Lazarus died. And he was in the tomb four days by the time Jesus showed up. And of course, both Mary and Martha, when they see Jesus, said, if you had been here, he wouldn't have died. Now imagine... Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. Believe in me and you will live even if you die. For everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe it? Amazing Amazing words by Jesus saying that I am the resurrection and the life. We sang it in a number of songs, and I was amazed at how often this comes up. But death was destroyed. Death was defeated. Actually, Jesus being the resurrection and the life, he put death to death. He made it possible for us. And how did he do that? Because Romans 4.25 says that he was delivered over on account of our transgressions and he was raised on account of our justification. And today, as we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus, it is good news that brings us hope. And the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 Almost at the end of the letter that he sends, the first letter that he sent to the Corinthians, having dealt with all of these horrible, difficult things, mentions the gospel. The gospel is good news. And there were some among them who were skeptical. I mean, it's, it's not hard to find a skeptic in our world today. The good news is good news because the resurrection of Jesus Christ actually happened. And if it didn't happen, 
We're pathetic. Let's take a look, first of all, in these first four verses. As the Apostle Paul first lays out the gospel, this is the good news, beloved. Now I make known to you, brothers, the gospel which I proclaimed as good news to you, which also you received, in which also you stand, by which also you are saved, since you hold fast the word, which I proclaim to you as good news, unless you believed for nothing. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also Receive that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried and that he was raised the third day according to the scriptures. That is the gospel. That is the good news. And that little phrase, according to the scriptures, says that what Jesus did was exactly what God, through the prophets, predicted he would do for for the redemption of a people for God's own glory. Christ died for our sins. Romans 5.8 says, God demonstrated his love to us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. 1 Peter 2.24 tells us, he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross that we might die to sin and live to righteousness, for by his wounds we are healed. And 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 18 says, Christ suffered also for our sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, so that he might bring us to God. First of all, when we say that Christ died for our sins and we think of the most famous and the first saying that Jesus made while on the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It was at that moment that we can be assured that God imputed the guilt of all the sins of believers onto his son Christ. He was pouring out his whole wrath for all eternity on Christ. And that's why 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21 says, he made him who knew no sin, that's Jesus, to be sin on our behalf. Christ didn't sin himself, but God treated Christ as if he committed all our sins so that he could treat us as if we live Christ's righteous life. But then he was buried. There are some skeptics who say that Jesus didn't really die. It's called the swoon theory, that he just fainted. I mean, it's a rough afternoon hanging on the cross after all. But you remember that time was getting late, and they wanted to, the guards wanted to get out of there, and they just wanted to put an end to it. So usually what they would do is they would go and take a hammer or some sledge and break the legs of those who are being crucified because history shows that there have been a couple occasions when men who haven't had their legs broken actually came off the cross when everybody was gone. They just pulled themselves off the cross. So by breaking their legs, they would suffocate sooner. When the centurion came to Jesus, they saw that he had already breathed his last. And we know scripture says that Jesus gave up his spirit. So instead of breaking his legs, and of course, scripture, the Old Testament prophesies that Jesus' bones would not be broken. So he didn't break the bones, not because he wanted to fulfill prophecy, but because he saw he was already dead. So he stuck a sword in his side and both blood and water rushed out. He was buried because he was dead. But Jesus' life, being the son of God, was, as uh, Hebrews chapter 7, verse 16 says, an indestructible life. Death could not hold him. 
And so the gospel message is that he raised on the third day for our justification. You see, his resurrection from the dead was God's stamp of approval on his sacrifice. If we died for our own sins, we would die in our own sins. We would be an, a blemished sacrifice, an unacceptable sacrifice for our own sins. Our sins would remain. There would be no death of death. But Christ lived a perfect life, died as an unblemished lamb, and God raised him from the dead. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 15 says, And he died for all, so that they who live would no longer live for themselves, but for him who died and rose on their behalf. We celebrate Easter because without the good news of Jesus' resurrection, the gospel is not good news. If all this was a fairy tale, we're hopeless. I mean, why not just go play golf this morning? It's a nice day. We get a couple of them, I know, throughout the year. <laughs> well, the Apostle Paul, after giving and reminding them of the gospel, the Apostle Paul addresses the skeptics. He goes on from verse 5 through 11 and he really gives crucial evidence that Jesus did raise from the dead. Now, if, if somebody dies and you watch him die, you watch them put him in a tomb, and then three days later, he knocks on your door, are you going to be a skeptic? I think the, um, one of the greatest evidences of Jesus' resurrection is his personal appearances. Let me read these verses for you. And that he, Jesus, appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom remain until now. That is, in, until the time Paul had wrote that, written that letter but some have fallen asleep. After that, he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, as one untimely born, he appeared to me also. For I am the least of the apostles and not worthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace toward me did not prove vain. But I labored even more than all them, all of them, yet not I, but the grace of of God with me. Whether then it was I or they, so we preach and so you believe. Paul provides several lines of uh, evidence for the validity of Jesus' resurrection, and that uh, primarily has to do with post resurrection appearances. Jesus' disciples believed that he had risen from the dead because they saw him. They talked with him. He cooked them breakfast. It's interesting that when we read uh, John chapter 20, the disciples held a particular posture between the crucifixion of Christ and his resurrection. And that posture was to go back to the upper room to close the doors and hide. The fear, of course, was that the chief priests and the Pharisees and the religious leaders who were responsible for stirring up the crowd to cry for Christ's re uh, crucifixion would next come after those who were following them. So they were hidden until they saw Jesus. And after Jesus appeared to them, there was a transformation. They were no longer cowering individuals. They became bold proclaimers of the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
They remain steadfast in the face of imprisonment and torture and martyrdom. So at the very least, it is absolutely clear that to them, Christ truly was alive. Notice also the dramatic change in Saul after seeing Jesus on the road to Damascus. From trying to destroy and persecute the church to one who was preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that's not lost on Paul. It never was lost on the Apostle Paul. That he once did not believe in Jesus and he was trying to destroy the sect that was proclaiming Jesus alive until he saw Jesus. James, the brother of Jesus, once a skeptic, suddenly changed to become the leader in the Jerusalem church after the resurrection of Jesus. We know in John chapter 7, verse 5, none of the brothers of Jesus believed in him. But after the resurrection, James changed. And Paul lists the following post-resurrection experiences. He appeared to Cephas, to the 12, to more than 500 at one time, to James, the brother of Jesus, to all the apostles, and then as one who was untimely born to Saul, who became Paul. Well, there's another um, interesting bit of, of evidence that we have to consider and that is the empty tomb. Did the disciples steal the body of Jesus, as some were suggesting? Let me read for you verse 11 through 15 of Matthew chapter 28. Now, while they were on their way, behold, some of the guard came into the city and reported to the chief priests that all, I mean, all that had happened and when they had assembled with the elders, they took counsel together. They gave a large sum of money to the soldiers and said, you are to say his disciples came by night and stole him away while we were asleep. And if this is heard before the governor, we will win him over and keep you out of trouble. See, if guards slept on duty, they would, in most cases, forfeit their life if the prisoner went free. So, um, okay, and it says, and they took the money and did as they had been instructed, and this story was widely spread among the Jews and is to this day. So, let's think about that. Consider that the Jews take precautions against the disciples by sealing the body. And they send a guard. A guard is uh, custodian, the, the Greek word, and it refers to a group of 16 trained men like our modern-day Green Beret or Navy SEALs. They were capable of defending these 16 men against an entire battalion of regular soldiers. They were on a four-man rotation 24-7. There were always four men awake. And they did this so that they split the day up into four um, sections so that they were always fresh and got plenty of rest. Each man carried three to five weapons. So to assume that all 16 soldiers slept at the same time is unlikely. And even if they were asleep, the way they positioned themselves in guarding something like a front door or in this case, a tomb that had a seal on the tomb so that if it was ever tampered with, they would know. And it was also there to say, look, you are, you are under penalty from Herod if you move or break this seal. So they would have to somehow slip in past all 16 sleeping Navy SEALs 
roll the stone away with none of them waking up, get the body of Jesus, unwrap him from the burial cloths, take the face cloth, fold it neatly, and set it off to the side, and then sneak out with the body of Jesus. The disciples, instead of planning a heist, the body of Jesus, they were freaked out with fear, hiding in the upper room. And then here's the other thing. How would the guards know that the disciples are the ones who stole the body of Jesus if they were asleep? Problem. The resurrection of Jesus is an established fact with eternal implications. It's not just true because some believe it. It's true, and that's why so many believe it. But still, some will say, um, you know, I don't believe. And look, I, I think it's pretty um, interesting that someone could say, okay, yeah, I believe the resurrection took place. There's enough evidence. Even the enemies of Jesus give evidence to seeing him and uh, seeing him alive, but I still won't believe. Well, you can believe that the chair you're sitting on won't hold you up, but that doesn't change the fact that the chair is holding you up, and you actually count on that. The Apostle Paul then gives some consequences of rejecting the resurrection. Let me read verse 12 and following. Now, if Christ is preached that he has been raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no res resurrection of the dead, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain. Your faith also is vain. Moreover, we are found uh, we are even found to be false witnesses of God because we bore witness against God and that he raised Christ whom he did not raise, if in fact the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is worthless. You are still in your sins. Then those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If we have hoped in Christ in this life only, we are of all men most to be pitied. The truth is that although Christ is proclaimed as having been risen from the dead, some claim that there is no resurrection for anyone ever. There is no good news, people, if we reject the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. Verse 13, Paul says, Christ has not been raised if he's still dead, our sins still remain a debt. We still have the death penalty. Verse 14, Paul says that his preaching and their faith is in vain. Telling people about Jesus or believing in Jesus is absolutely worthless if the resurrection didn't take place. Worse, in verse 15, Paul says um, his preaching qualifies as being a heretic giving false witness. The, the God whom Paul claims to serve in preaching the gospel of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, if Christ hasn't been raised from the dead, then Paul himself is a false prophet, a heretic, a false witness. Verses 16 to 17, he goes on, our faith is in vain and we're still in our sins. Christ may have died on account of our transgressions, but if he was not raised, we have no justification. Justification is a declaration of God that we are restored to righteousness because of our faith in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. Our condition is hopeless. Verse 18, Paul says, you know all those believers who died in Christ? And we believe that they're in the presence of God. Paul actually wrote that in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 
To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. He said, look, if, if there's no resurrection, they're gone. They've perished. They've just kind of, there's no hope in that. In verse 19, if we believe that there is hope in Jesus Christ and he's not raised from the dead, we are of all people most to be pitied. There are billions of people all around the world that celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ. They may not live for Jesus. They may not all have surrendered their life in submission to his lordship. But of all those people who come and celebrate and, and worship on Resurrection Sunday, they're all to be pitied. It's a sad commentary if we reject the resurrection of Jesus, but it's even sadder if we believe the resurrection but haven't given our life to Christ. I mean, if, if something like that has happened, and it has, can you just ignore it? Is there any hope? Is there any possibility of good to ignore or reject the provision of God for our sin and the resurrection of his son from the dead? My favorite verse in this whole passage is how the Apostle Paul ends this section. But now, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. You know what he's saying there? Because Christ has risen from the dead. You know how you mourn your loved ones? You do not mourn as those who do not have hope. There is hope. He's just the first fruit. And because he's risen from the dead, we have the hope of that eternal life and reunion with our loved ones who died in Christ. That's why Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. Believe in me and you will live even if you die. And everyone, every person in this sanctuary and every person in every church across the world who lives and believes in him will never die. You don't have to fear death. Christ's death, burial, and resurrection in that great event of the gospel. He put death to death. And that's why this day changed everything. That's why it's celebrated all over the world. That's why we put our faith in Jesus because he's a great God and a living God. Savior. Praise God for the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, there is no greater news than the resurrection of Jesus. And because you raised him from the dead and he was declared the son of God by that miraculous event, we surrender our lives to Christ. Lord, we believe in Jesus. We confess him. And I pray that there's no person in this place who will go through another Easter Sunday while keeping you at an arm's distance. 
May we open our hearts, receive the gift of life that the resurrection and the life Jesus Christ has offered to us today. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.